Good morning, everybody. It's Sherry Dutterer here from The Writing Glitch. I am so excited and honored to have Jason. I, I forgot it again. Say it. Or tea tie. <laughs> or tea tie. I want to say it phonetically. Ah, and I've been practicing it phonetically, and so it was not working. I want to share a story before we get started today, because this is the this story I think encompasses the kids that we see here in, in all over the world that are struggling with reading, writing, and math. And it's a story about Ben. Ben was a third grade student, or yeah, third grade, and he was expelled from three schools. I'm like, how can a kid at, at that age, eight years, nine, 10 years old, be expelled from school? Well, he was having these behaviors that just, they didn't know how to deal with. So he's sitting in an IEP meeting in August with a new school. He, mom was praying that he was going to be able to get accepted into that school. And it just happened that one of my clients, her name's Kristen, was in that meeting. She had just completed my course on dysgraphia, which is a disability in writing, which is what the writing glitch is all about. And within 30 days, they had a new IEP. But then Kristen gets this call in October and mom is crying. And this is where it hits me. It gets my heart is because she was telling this story of how Ben was running after the bus before the bus was, was trying to get to the bus stop. The bus had to stop early. And he is so excited to go to school because he's learning how to read. He's learning how to write. And it's all because of a thing called structured literacy. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And I have the pleasure of joining with uh, our representative joining me. And I want to read his bio before we get started in the interview. Boosting creation, reforming the tax code, and strengthening educational opportunities and solving local issues are top priorities for representative. I'll never say it right. <laughs> you can just call me Jason for the purposes Jason, of this. Uh, that's podcast. good. I can <laughs> handle Jason. And that's my son's middle name. <laughs> it means warrior. I don't know if you knew that. In, in a current legislation session, Jason serves on two House committees, education and transportation. God bless you for doing that. He also has a representative chairman of subcommittee on highways and bridges and transportation committee and the representative chair for the subcommittee of the special education under the education committee. He lives in Washington County with his wife and daughter, and he is out there just helping the world of special education go to new levels here. Because in the 21st century, we are in a challenge to learn more about what is happening and the science behind reading, writing, and math. So Representative Jason, Thank you for being here. And one of the questions I ask my clients or my uh, guests before I even get into the interview is, how are you doing, really? <laughs> well, thanks for having me. I, I've been doing great. Uh, quite honestly, I spent the entire summer uh, hanging out and doing fun things with my daughter. Uh, she's two years old, so we, we've got to experience oh. many bounce houses and playhouses and outdoor playgrounds and all over the place. So I've been having a blast. It's been wonderful. <laughs> It's it's so much fun when they're that age and then they hit school and then like this whole world changes because when they're in that zero to five range, their brain is growing. That right brain is really being curious and everything. And then we hit kindergarten and they expect the left brain to start working and the left brain doesn't necessarily kick in quite right away, does it? <laughs> <laughs> nope. We're, we're learning lots here. She's, uh, she's a really smart girl. She remembers every single thing. Uh, it, it's just, it's nonstop with her and, and I love it. Um, I'm, I know I'm going to miss the, the nights where she's, which, cause she always says, daddy, hold my hand when we go to bed. And you know, that, that stuff's not going to last forever. <laughs> no, no. And, uh, do, do it as long 
as she will let you do it because they get to the point where they go off to college and then it's not there. (laughs) So pray with her, hold her hand at night and do whatever you can right before bed. So just (laughs) cherish those moments. So unlike the crowd that I often have here on the podcast, I invited everyone that I knew, including my 80-year-old parents, because I really want the world to understand what's happening here between why I was taught in school. Okay, I have a couple years on you. I went to school when it was whole literacy, (laughs) you know, whole language, and I remember struggling. And the more I learn about structured literacy, the more I realized how much I struggled. I know I struggled with writing because that's like the manifestation. Sorry, I could, I'm going to keep swatting because I have this fruit fly in my face. <laughs> and so the, there we go, live people, you're getting to see the, the raw. Um, but the more I learn about the science of reading, the science of writing, and how it also intersects with math, the more I realized how much of a challenge and how much I worked to get the B's and C's that I got. So I never qualified for special education. Well, back in those days, it didn't even happen. But um, but what is the difference between this whole language and the structured literacy to your understanding? Now, I know that you have not gone through education um, because you have a business background, but what is your understanding of what is happening out there in this world? Well, the, the main issue is, is we have literacy rates, especially across the Commonwealth of PA that have just been sinking and sinking for the last couple of decades. And what we're doing right now just just isn't working. I mean, the, the latest round uh, of state scores has a set of 32% proficiency rate across the state. That's not something we should be proud of. So that to me should be raising a ton of red flags saying, hey, over here, something's wrong, something's wrong. Um, so we need to do something about that. And I'm sure- do, do you know any scores about writing? Um, I haven't seen the writing scores, no, but I would imagine they're probably correlated. <laughs> they're even worse. <laughs> I will tell you this, the scores that I found on the National Report Card overall for fourth graders across the country was at the basic level. It wasn't even proficient level. It was at the basic level. And there, 75% of fourth graders can write at a basic level. That's horrible. <laughs> it, look, and it's getting worse. And, and, you know, and one of the main issues, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to tackle one issue like this is, is we really haven't done anything transformative to our school system statewide. And I mean, probably at least 20 years, maybe even longer. I mean, I've been in office now for nine years. And we just recently, I would say last year, finally made some bigger changes. Uh, and especially around early literacy, we were able to get post-secondary schools to finally start implementing, if you're going to school to be a teacher, to take classes in structured literacy and science of reading so that when you graduate and you pass your praxis, that you know what you're doing and you know how to teach this stuff because we weren't doing that before. Mm -mm. And I'll be honest, we got a lot of pushback from the schools, a lot of pushback. As a matter of fact, even after the bill was signed into law by Governor Wolf, uh, a lot of the schools refused to even acknowledge its existence and they were not going to do anything. Thanks to then Secretary uh, Eric Haggerty, I was able to team up with him and we were able to, to get this fixed pretty quickly. So starting next school year, that will be a requirement for all post-secondary schools across the state. Yay. <laughs> now, my little soapbox is net next, next tackle is mandating education for writing skills because kids should, teachers don't know how to teach kids how to write. And so that's my little soapbox that I'm going to plug in uh, for our next round of, of transformation. But that's all the sidebar and, and some of that history. Bearing in mind that a lot of the people that are going to listen today do not understand anything about these bills. What is in House Bill 998? What is in Senate Bill 801? What are the like similarities and differences and what's happening? <laughs> so uh, I will I will make this uh, as easy as I can uh, to, to explain. So uh, that both Senate and House members can introduce legislation. 
And Senator Ahmed and I, along with Representative Fleming, who's my Democrat co-prime in the House, uh, and Senator Williams, who is uh, Senator um, Ahmed's co-prime in the Senate, so we have a Republican and Democrat on both sides, we introduced the same bill. Uh, it just has a different number. Everything will be exactly the same. Um, but in order for it to get signed into law, it has to pass both chambers uh, and then go to the governor for a signature. So we figured uh, if we couldn't get the bill to move in the House, maybe we could get to move in the Senate or vice versa. So that's why there's two bills. They do the same exact thing. The language is the same. Uh, we've been working together on this now for the whole year. Uh, so there, there are no differences between the two bills. The only difference is the bill number. That's it. So- <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that yeah. because I was trying to compare them and it kind of looked the same, but I was like, okay, am I missing something? <laughs> <laughs> so the original language as introduced is going to change. Uh, over the last year, we've been meeting with different stakeholders, different groups, advocacy groups, experts. So we're both writing an amendment right now. Uh, we're waiting on the Department of Education to get back to us on their final input uh, and then the language of the original introduced bill, which is what everybody can see right now, will be updated and changed. And I will tell you, I will go through this step by step about what is actually in the amendment and what will be in the bill uh, as it moves forward. So here we go. I think right off the bat, one of the most important things, early screenings. So all the way across the state, kindergarten through third grade, every student will be required to be screened at least three times per year. And we do stipulate it has to be in the beginning of the year, the middle part of the year, and somewhere near the end of the year. We don't lay out the exact dates. We leave that up to the schools for their discretion. Uh, but it doesn't mean they won't be tested more because the reason we do these three screenings is to track progress. Um, if they're not tracking where they need to be, then we'll screen again and we'll figure out where they are and we'll give them an individualized plan. And that's the second part of this bill is if kids are falling behind, then they need to be given an improvement plan, a reading plan. Um, and that's something that the teacher can work with the parents and the students on to make sure that they're not falling behind because we all know how important it is to learn how to read proficiently by the end of third grade. So that's that part of it. Um, in addition to the screening so, part. So let me pause yeah. there. So then the progress then the, with the individualized plan that would take them like to title one before they would ever get to an IEP or 504. Yes. And that's so that's a twofold there's a twofold reason for that one is down the line it's like preventative uh health care um you get your you get your shots your vaccines you go for your checkups um what we're trying to do is preventative care here so that there's a little bit more of an upfront cost but down the line it saves a lot of money the money's mm -hmm. important but not as important as quality of life so to me by by hitting this early and making sure the kids are proficient and we and we're catching this that we can get them set up for a better quality of life for the rest of their academic career and beyond. So those are two primary reasons why this early screening is so important. And I'm gonna pause you there before you move on because I want the listeners to hear this this uh, statement. It costs eight times as much money here in Pennsylvania to have a kid on special education than it does general education. Right now, before this bill is passed, what I've seen in the historical records as I'm looking through the statistics is it costs about right now about $20,000 to educate a child. It's going to cost $160,000 as soon as we add any of those specialized supports. So going Title I is going to be a bridge in between where it might cost them a little bit more money, but it's not going to be near the $160,000 to, to educate. So just understand that what we're trying to do is save the state money by these universal screenings. And that's a really important part because our special education cost line item has been exploding I mean, it's growing at an exponential rate. It's not a linear growth. It is exponential. Uh, and we Amen. need to get this <laughs> under control because we just can't afford to, to allow this to continue happening. Yes. So second part of your uh, amendments. <laughs> second part, teacher training. So we require all the schools that are participating in this, and we will be mandating this statewide if this bill passes, uh, that all teachers K through fourth grade uh, some administrators and reading specialists, as well as special ed teachers, will be required to get training in structured literacy um, as part of this legislation. And I know everyone's probably wondering, well, who's going to pay for this? Well, part of the agreement that we've made so far with some of the stakeholders in the department is, is that the state will be providing uh, all of the financial resources this for every school district across the state who hasn't already implemented this. 
Um, there are schools that are already doing this. I have four back at home in my district that are already doing everything here. They won't need to, uh, they will not need to change anything. So we want to make sure that we're giving the teachers the resources they need in order to effectively teach this curriculum, because without that, it doesn't work. So my understanding, just hearing the scuttlebutt and kind of being around the folks in, uh, Berks County is many of the districts here in Berks County have already started educating their teachers. In fact, I took the Wilson introductory course myself, so I had some understanding of what they were being taught. I have no desire to be a, pra a practitioner, so I did not get complete the course. So that's two more courses. So there's three courses that these teachers have to take to be certified to understand what happens with a structured literacy. Yeah, and the Wilson certification is extensive. It's expensive and it is time consuming. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not easy to get, but once people get it, I'll tell you, we had some pushback here in my local school district at first, but every single teacher who went through it, who had some, some reservations, has they've all flipped. They love it. They're so happy they went through it. They can see the difference they're making. Uh, their students are progressing. Um, we're in year three, I think, in my home district now, and you're really starting to see the results of this. It's really, really working. It's it's amazing to see where what they taught before and how Wilson and some of the other Orton Gillingham programs change it. Wilson's very popular in Pennsylvania, but in other parts of the country, they use other um, programs, but they're all based on the science that Orton Gillingham uh, found, founded. So Orton was one professor, Gillingham was another, it was two professors. So that that's where OG comes from in our world of structured literacy. And so Wilson is one of the programs and that's a very popular here in Pennsylvania. So let's, I believe what most of the uh, intermediate units are utilizing as their education it gets disseminated. Yeah, I, I believe that's correct, at least out here for the two that I have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we've already covered my next question, which is same and different because they're all the same. Was there any other parts to the bill that you wanted to talk about before I asked my last question? Right. So there's, I think there's three more parts here and I'll go through okay. them fairly quickly. So if we're going to require the entire state to do this, all 500 school districts, um, instead of each school district vetting their own vendors and 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 going through all that process because that is time consuming and a pain in the butt. This bill creates a, a committee with uh, subject matter experts to pick all the high quality vendors. It's going to be an open and transparent process. You will see the scores and how these vendors were selected. And then every school district can pick from this list of vendors uh, on which curriculum or which, which uh, if they want to use Amplify, if they want to use AIM, whatever letters, whatever program they want to use, it's vetted. It's proven and it'll save the school district a lot of time and money uh, in picking that out. So th that was that was something that was not originally in the bill, but after working with other groups in PDE, that's something they wanted to see. So happy to oblige. Um, so am, am, just so people are aware, what uh, Jason mentioned was the company Amplify. That's another program similar to Wilson. Yeah, and there's a lot of these groups out there. We just want to make sure because mm -hmm. um, not all of them are high quality. Uh, and a lot of them just said, oh, well, we're science of reading, and they put their stamp on it, and people think that, that that's it. So we want to make sure that we're getting the, the real, genuine deal here. Um, so that part's important. The next part, state reporting. Right now, in the state of Pennsylvania, we have no idea who's using this curriculum and who's, who's using, who is implementing structured literacy. We have no idea. Nobody's reporting it to the Department of Education. Uh, so it's basically, we have to go and ask every single school district what they're doing. Um, we need that information. And then we're going to be tracking this once this bill is signed into law. Who's doing it? What's your scores look like? Have they improved? Are they not improving? Are you getting training? Those sorts of things. Because we need that. We need it at the state level to make sure that this is working. Um, and the last part, this, this last part uh, actually uh, came from one of my colleagues. Um, we're going to ban 3 queuing in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, Say that again? We're going to ban 3 queuing. Okay. No more, no more uh, of the old literacy programs, um, structured literacy, no more queuing to get kids to guess what the word is by looking at pictures. That, that's done. Uh, that, that came as a request uh, from one of the stakeholder groups to insert that in there. So that will be implemented 
uh, just like other states have done as well, because we had thought that, oh, well, we're going to we're going to mandate everyone use structured literacy uh, and high quality vendors across the state, but we're still going to allow you to use the three queuing. So we said, no, we're not doing that anymore. That's going to be in the bill uh, and that we won't be able to teach these old methods that don't work and are not backed by science. Ah, OK. I understand what you're saying now. <laughs> I'm glad you elaborated a little bit because I was like, huh, what's he trying to sell me? So that I did not realize was going to as was part of it. Obviously, I don't see the new uh, amended uh, uh, words, but that is really good because that was a lot of what I was taught back in the seventies about uh, language. And yeah, it didn't always work. It didn't always work. Yeah, and that was the mix. And a lot of schools right now are still teaching balanced literacy, and that's what that is. You know. Um, I'm on the Basic Education Funding Commission. Uh, we have to get a report out by January about changing the formula. And I'm asking a lot of these superintendents, hey, are you using structured literacy? And a lot of them are telling me, no, they're using balance. And you go back and look at their scores and their kids are suffering. And they keep telling me, we don't have the money to make the switch and, and change the curriculum. Uh, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, all right, so now we're chicken or egg here. Like what happens first? We can't get, and then they're complaining about special ed costs down the line. And I'm like, <laughs> let's fix this up front. So we don't have those huge costs. <laughs> well, I am so glad that education is finally taking a proactive approach to making the changes. I will get my soapbox again. We need to also have a, just a little bit of information in there about teaching teachers how to, to write. I, I, I think that is going to be one of those things. And and it doesn't come in this bill. I'm I'm hoping that in the next round of bills that we can add that because it is one of the parts that as I was out at the International Dyslexia Association conference uh, earlier this month, right before the rally in Harrisburg, and even those curriculums that are out there, not all of them have caught on to anything with reading. I mean, writing. And so there's a gap even in the structured literacy programs and curricula um, with how to create explicit, systematic, cumulative, multisensory writing programs. The area that I see is the deficit is cumulative. There's a lot of structure uh, on how to write letters, but that cumulative approach to integrate it into reading is where we need some extra support. No, I, I agree with you. And, you know, one of the hardest things as a legislator uh, is that when we go and ask for things and we write legislation, a lot of times it gets watered down over the course of time. Uh, mm -hmm. Look, on average, it takes six years to get a bill signed into law. And we only serve two-year terms in the House. So it's, it's hard to get bills passed. Um, so sometimes we have to basically settle for some of the breadcrumbs uh, from our whole loaf of bread and just try to keep coming back over and over again. Yeah, That's what we did last year. That's how we were able to get uh, voluntary structured literacy in the state along with what I talked about earlier with uh, post-secondary training. That was step one. Step two is the full rollout. Uh, and then step three, we, we're happy to incorporate the writing, uh, but also how do, we, how do we capture those kids that we lost after fourth grade that are no longer going to be part of this program because we have to get there. We're seeing other states start to implement programs to go back after those, I'll call them lost kids, because we we failed them. We we cannot let them basically just go off without trying to do something. So that'll be the next step after this. Oh, thank you. That was one of my other questions is what are we doing about those kids that are struggling and are going to graduate? Um, so I, I remember when I graduated in 1982 from high school, that like 50% of my high school class struggled with reading. And there was a big push then. And of course, whole literacy was the big thing there. Balanced literacy didn't even exist yet. And so it has really changed over the years. And what I, and the holes that I see is there was a big push early on with penmanship and he had to practice writing. And then all of a sudden um, writing disappeared. But I do know that curriculum um, mandates are pulling back writing into 
the curriculum, learning how to handwrite, learning how to write cursive, learning how to transition from the reading to the writing. And so I'm a resource for you if you need uh, uh, that background, but I commend you for everything that you've done. It is amazing that this has come to this point. Now, you told me around 930 today, the Senate is voting on something. What, what are they doing at 930 this morning? So this morning, the Senate Education Committee is having a hearing on Senate Bill 801, which is the mirror bill of the structured literacy bill from the House. Uh, they're having expert testimony uh, from many different people this morning uh, about what's in the bill, how how beneficial it is, why it's necessary, uh, and, and what it can do for the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, my hope is, is that after they have the hearing this morning, uh, that it will have the votes to get out of committee in advance. Uh, once we add the amendment in and hopefully soon it'll it'll see a vote um, but uh, this is big this morning is really big because uh, this hearing hopefully will convince the, the state senators on the education committee that this is necessary uh, it needs to be voted out of committee and, and move forward in the legislative process okay so for those of you who are out there that are pennsylvanians call your senator call your representative and say hey let's move forward this is very important and I'm so grateful that you were able to clarify some of those questions for me today because there was a when I go reading through that, I'm going, oh, I see just so many more things that need to happen. But you know, this is a big step. It's a huge, huge step forward for helping our kids and not having situations like Ben. And, and and that that's the important part. You know, I, I have a couple of constituents who who have gone through very similar stories, just like Ben. And and you see, like they're just sad, they were depressed, they're causing trouble, and then all of a sudden they finally get what they need, and their whole life turns around. All right, um, amen. That's yeah, it's what we amazing need. in days. Exactly, and and that that's why we do what we do is to help these kids have a fair shot at life because we are not giving them what they need right now, and we need to change that. Yeah. So for, for those of you who are older, don't have kids in school right now, the prison pipeline has really been fed by kids who can't read, write, and do math. And so the other thing is that 33% of all IEPs are because kids can't read, write, and do math. It's not because of autism. It's not because of emotional disturbance. It's these three areas and if we don't get those three areas under under control our costs are going to skyrocket even more so thank you thank you very much jason for everything that that you're doing is there anything that you'd like to say in closing uh just real quick you know i was at a conference a couple weeks ago uh, I think her name was Nancy. She said the first time that most people get a reading screening to see if they're dyslexic or have a reading disorder is when they're in the uh, federal uh, or when they're in prison. It's the first what? time. Yeah. And oh. throw another staggering stat at you. Over 50% of Pennsylvania's state prison population can't read and or has a reading disorder. I mean, over 50%. So that goes right to what you're talking about. That's That's another reason why this is so important that we get this right. Yeah. It's it's so sad. It is absolutely atrocious that this has gone on this long in life. And but we are making a change, and that's what counts. So the writing glitch is typically published um, via Apple and Spotify and Google Podcasts and anywhere podcasts are are um, distributed on the second and fourth Tuesday of the month. This has been a special episode that I've done live on Facebook. I'm hoping that it's live on Facebook right now. Tomorrow, Russ Lloyd is going to, his episode is going to be released. He has a website where he's curating all articles on dyslexia. And Jason, he lives in the area around you somewhere. Um, his, he belongs to, I believe if I'm remembering correctly, the Providence School. I think he is part of that system. And he has curated this website and they have an app that they're working on to help kids with dyslexia as well. So look for that tomorrow on your favorite podcast app. 
do me a favor. If you like today's episode, if you like any of the other episodes, subscribe and hit that review button and give us some feedback on how what you're thinking about this podcast. And you can always go right to thewritingglitch.com and you will get all of the episodes there. You can look for the Emotional Kids Summit, which was done back in August. And that was a every day, Monday through Friday. So there's some things that, that we have done to help get the information to you. Remember, you were put here for such a time as this. Have a wonderful Monday. And thank you, Jason, for being here. And thank you for not making me say your name more than once. <laughs> thank you, Sherry. I appreciate it. <laughs>